bless me now, my Savior. I come to Thee. We are in 1 Corinthians today as we are endeavoring to finish this book. And I plan on finishing it end of February. If you're new to the church, we go verse by verse through the Bible so that you can get a feel for it yourself and find yourself in the pages of it, your identity in Scripture. And um, today we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 through, I want to say 13, but I like verse 14 too. But here we go. Now I come to you, I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I'm passing through Macedonia, and it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you, if the Lord permits. But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. And if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord as I also do. Therefore, let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace that he may come to you, come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. Watch. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word today. I pray that you use this time to benefit each person here. Let us hear from your spirit this morning. We need your counsel, your direction. And, and I pray that you use me now, Lord God, to speak your word well. In Jesus' name, to the lives of those I care about very much. Amen. Praise God. So when I read this, I did not know if it would just preach itself, you know. Some verses of scriptures, you know, you read and you're like, oh man, that, that just preaches all by itself. But when I'm reading, now I'll come to you when I pass through Macedonia and I may remain, it just doesn't give me the warm fuzzies, you know. And so I had to spend a little time in the word, letting it marinate and speak to my heart. And, and uh, as, I, as I sat there and looked at it, I saw principles for successful ministry that were modeled by the Apostle Paul. And it's going to take me two weeks to preach through this. But I want to share with you these principles this morning of successfully doing the Lord's work. We read here... Uh, in verse 10, concerning Timothy, Paul says, For he does the work of the Lord as I also do. How many of you like to do the work of the Lord like Paul did? He says, He does the work of the Lord as I also do. And I see that in verse 10 of chapter 16. And then the last verse of chapter 15 in verse 58, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord. There's that phrase again, the work of the Lord. Knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so there is a work that the Lord has called us to. And as I was thinking about what the work of the Lord is, it can be summarized in two areas. Number one, it is summarized in the work of evangelism. Luke chapter 19 verse 10, Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So there are people that are lost. They have no connection to God. They're just going through life. They don't know where they come from, where they've been, or where they're really going. And they're lost. And Christ has come to reconcile us to God, to give our lives meaning and purpose and value and beauty that the world does not bestow upon us outside of Christ. So how many of you know that part of the work of the church is to go get lost people and bring them to Christ? See lives that have been uh, destroyed by this world and by sin and see them redeemed by Christ. How many of you know that's, that is part of the work of the Lord? To see people's lives restored because of Christ. There are a lot of people that don't know the forgiveness that we have in Christ. 
They're working for it. They're trying to be good enough. I heard those kids say drugs and being good. <laughs> oh, those are my kind of kids. Amen. I love those kids because you have to be good to go to heaven. The problem is none of us are good enough. And we need what Christ did on the cross and his mercy so that we can leave, leave, uh, live grateful lives uh, because of what he's done for us. And so the work of the Lord has to do in, with going out to people that have not been reached and meeting that need. And then also the work of the Lord, uh, we find in Acts chapter 1 verse 3, speaks of Jesus as after he was raised from the dead, he was seen by the twelve uh, for 40 days and spoke the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus, from the very beginning of his ministry, had disciples that followed him, and he built them up and he equipped them. And so the work of the Lord is evangelism, and the work of the Lord is equipping the saints for ministry and edifying the saints, taking somebody that's weak and staying with them until they're very strong in the Lord. How many of you can say today, by God's grace, You've overcome some things that you used to really, really struggle, had you down for the count. And not to say you're perfect, but you've made progress because of God. Can I see your hand? And that's, that's the ministry of the church. We are here to equip each other and to make ourselves stronger and edify each other. And this is what the work of the Lord is. And he says here in verse 58, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. The word steadfast means literally to sit down in your convictions. Don't move. Be steadfast and movable. Don't be carried away from the hope you have. Be unshakable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Everybody say always. No matter what you're going through. The command of scripture is. You're always abounding. In the work of the Lord. The word abound means to overdo it. I want to overdo it this year. I went on vacation and got excited for a second. Then I got all my texts and I realized I was just taking a breather before I came back to overdo it. <laughs> Always abounding. Overdo it. If you're going to serve the Lord, then overdo it. Glory to God. Be steadfast and movable and overdo it. When it comes to working for the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, what you do is not in vain. The word labor means to toil till exhaustion. And the Bible says you're not really serving them unless they exhaust you to do it. Some of y'all look exhausted already, praise God. Amen. But I'm going to get so weary this, this year. I'm going to get so weary for Jesus. I just can't wait to get weary from working so hard for him. And the Bible says, Know that everything you do, even the little things. Bible, Jesus said even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, it counts for eternity. You take a man or a woman's life that's served the Lord for many years and all those things pile up. The Bible says there are, are treasures in heaven. And so we're very grateful for the opportunity to serve the Lord and know that it is not in vain. Everybody say no. Isn't it exciting to know something about what you're doing for the Lord? It's not in vain. Amen. We talked about giving. He deals with giving in the first four verses of chapter 16. And there needs to be a passion in our giving. We spoke on that extensively, how we need to be principled in our giving to the Lord. And now we're going to talk about our work here. As Paul models it, and I'm going to give you, uh, well, let me just, let me just continue for a moment when it, when I'm talking about labor, because the power of Didus is a good model of that. Philippians chapter two, verse 30, because of the work of Christ, Paul says, Epaphroditus came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me of such men we esteem. Paul esteemed men who did not regard their own life in serving others. It says he came close to death for the work of Christ. That's toiling till, till exhaustion. I'm praying that I get sick this year from working so hard for Jesus, and then I get healed and go do it again. 
Romans chapter 16, verse 3 and 4 says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So there's a risking of your neck when it comes to always abounding in the work of the Lord. There's a little bit of risk, isn't there, when you serve? You risk something. It costs you something. And I'm praying for that in our lives, that we risk some things for one another this year. When we talk about building or working for the Lord or being good business for Him, we've got to stick to the biblical standards. That's why every week I go through the Bible with you guys. And I pray it's not exhaustive and laborious for you, for me to go through these things. Some of us just want a good little worship service and have a little buzz, spiritual buzz and go home. And you get, and you go to maybe a church that has a little bitty tiny verse. And that's it. But my heart is that you grow in the knowledge of the word of God. Why? Because these are the blueprints for your life. And when you study this, you learn how to be careful with your life to not only do the work of the Lord, but do it His way. You work for any company, and you've got to play by the rules of that company. If you're an athlete, you've got to play by the rules. If you're a football player, a track runner, anything, there are rules. And why is it that there are rules for everything else in this world except for your walk with Christ? There are rules to play lest you be disqualified. Um. We're looking at building at some point a building in the front here, if the Lord wills. And I'm believing that it's going to come to pass. We're going to build out there. But man, I did not know all the preparation that it took to build. You've got to have plans. I didn't even know you had to have plans. Did you know that for a building? There's got to be like architect stuff. I just want to throw something up there and get over there. You know, you got to have architectural drawings. What a buzzkill, man. You got to have a topography report and civil report. Those things cost money and nobody even sees anything. And so we're doing all this prep work. But when you build a building, you got to build according to the plans. You got to build up to code, which is really cool because we're not really in Rockwall City. So that's, so there are some things we can get away with, you know, I guess. When I was out in California, they wouldn't let my buddy build on his property because there was an endangered ant of some sort, a bug, and the bug had to be spared, and so they had to sell the land in order to save the bugs in California. Let me be thankful that you're in Texas. Come on, somebody. Amen. I praise God. Amen. Yeehaw. The stars at night. Glory to God. Amen. You got to build up to code, and then you have to have uh, somebody come in and inspect everything and make sure that it was done right. So if we want to build well, we've got to play by the rules. We've got to have a plan. And things have to be inspected and, and so forth. And the same with building your house. You've got to come in here and if you don't know the Bible, you get in. Start studying, start reading. You say, oh, it's too mysterious. It's really not. There are no brainers in this book. It's just people don't want to do it. They want to do things their own way because in their hearts they believe they're God and everything should play by their rules. And the problem is that you're a slave. You're, you know, you think you're free as an American, but you're a slave. You're either a slave to your flesh, slave to the devil, or you're a slave to God. But he has ownership rights over you. You're not God. And you have to play by his rules. And I'm sorry for that. That must break your heart, some of you. When you realize through a bunch of hard lessons in your life and crash and burns that maybe you need to start building his way. You become a little more careful with applying the word of God to your life instead of saying, man, that just wasn't the buzz, buzzy, buzz, buzz service that I wanted. Because I'm more interested in how you think than how you feel. Amen. Amen. Praise God, I'll step all over your toes to get you thinking right because I don't want you to go down that road again. I can't tell you how many people, they come to me for counseling, but they don't want my opinion. They want 
just to be heard after they've spread it all over Facebook before they get to me. They don't care about the nail that's right in the center of their head that if I pointed it out, they'd just lose it, you know. Do you really want to know what I think? No, you don't want to know what I think. You just want to talk. And I was with a, a Catholic guy yesterday at the gym and he says, man, so you're a pastor. He says, are you like a priest? He says, do y'all have a confession box? Do people come to you for confession? I said, yeah, it's my iPhone. <laughs> I said, no, we don't formally do confession, but they don't stop everybody in the church from finding my ears all day long, every day. Oh, we don't believe in that confession stuff. We go straight to God. Well, why are you bothering me all the time then? <laughs> Lord, have mercy. And people always sharing their feelings, but do you really want instruction? Are you interested in really building well with your life? That's why you go to this church. So Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He says to Timothy in, in that same chapter, uh, verse 5, but also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he completes, competes according to the rules. Titus 1.16, Paul says, there are people that profess to know God, but in their works they deny Him. Being abominable, disobedient, disqualified for every good work. Paul says that Christians, believers, can spend their life building a house of gold, silver, and precious stones, or they can spend their life building houses of wood, hay, and stubble. Take heed how you build. Now, I believe that every true believer bears fruit, but I believe that there are going to be people that are going to look over their life, and they've had crash and burn, crash and burn times, and I'm not... I'm not saying that to shame you. I'm saying that because I don't want to do that this year. How many of you want to learn from the hard lessons and do, do things better 2024? And as this year approaches, I want us to let go of yesterday and I want us to prepare ourselves for our tomorrow. Amen. Praise the Lord. Philippians chapter 3 says that we are to let go of our past. And I read it this morning. One thing I do, I let go of yesterday. And I want to say this to you guys. Not only are we to be careful to study the word of God and obey it and build well. But I just want to remind you that your call is a great call. It's an upward call. And um, he says here in this passage in verse 9, a great and effective door has opened to me. And the word great means mega in the Greek. It means to be great or to be greater than. He says, I have many adversaries, but the door that has been opened to me is greater. It's effective. And when God went and found Moses, Moses had been on the back side of the desert for 40 years. And he, would, he had a, a moral failure where he killed a man in his own strength. And he fled from Egypt, fled from Pharaoh. Been living in defeat for 40 years when God found Moses in the burning bush. And he calls Moses and Moses says, I'm not the right guy. I can't even talk. I have a stutter. And I'm going to be your mouthpiece. But it was the call of God that was great. Not Moses. It was the call of God that made Moses great. And every time you go in the Old Testament, God's finding somebody uh, who is unfit for the job. Because if you brought everything to the table at the beginning, you'd get all the glory for it. But if God finds somebody that nobody would pick, find some little shepherd boy to take, take out some giant. See, when God called you, not many of you were wise. Not many of you were smart. A lot of you were foolish. And God did that to confound the wise. When he raises you up and makes something out of nothing. So that he gets all the glory because he's God and deserves it. Why do I say this to you? Not only are we to be careful with how we build, but we're not to bring pride to the table this year. 
We're to remember that it's the call of God that's great upon our lives and that makes us great. It's the great God that sends us. It's the great God that's building his house and took people like us and qualified the disqualified. I want us today to thank God. You know, they were about to go into the promised land. They said, we're little, we're little grasshoppers. We are not fit to do this. And that's the whole idea. God takes people that are unfit and he calls them with a great calling. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are the called of God. The word ecclesia in the Greek for church means the called out ones. You're called. There's a call of God on your life. There is a ministry for your life that I can't do. There are people that God has called you to reach that I can't reach. You are wired the way you're wired to reach the people that you're called to reach. God's done a work in your heart deeply. And out of that work comes the work of the Lord that you are to do. And it's precious and it's great. Everybody say great. It's greater than your sin, greater than your adversaries. It is without repentance, the gifts and callings of God. And you may disqualify yourself at some point, but I'm telling you, God comes back, doesn't he? Just like he came back for Simon Peter, Jesus keeps coming back and calling us and say, turn it into a lesson and let's go at it again. Oh, I really let God down. I'm terrible. You think too much of yourself. Remember how he called you when you were defeated. And that's why you've got to let go of your past and answer the upward call that's on your life. And it's a great call. Everybody say great. great. It's great. It's not, it's not subpar. You're not some second tier Christian. You're a part of the body of Christ. You belong. And there's a great and mighty call on your life that you have to grab a hold of and let go of yesterday. You say, oh, I've lost so much. Paul lost a lot too. I've lost so many things, John. You don't know the loss. Yeah, but you get Jesus out of this deal and there's an upward call telling you to look up because there's a future ahead. And so I just want to encourage you to be careful, but also know you've been called with a great calling. And let's not walk in pride this year. Let's walk in humility, knowing that he's the one who makes us great. And that his calling is what makes us great. And there's not a great man in that Bible that didn't have a great calling on their lives. Great woman as well. They did great things for God because the call of God was great. And God found them all the same way. They're all terrible. They're all mess up, screw up sinners. How many of you know Abraham was a liar? How many of you have ever lied on your wife so much you told somebody of yours that it was your sister? Man, that's bad, dude. That's not good. You ever killed a man to have, to have his wife? It's bad. It's not good. And God uses all these crazy people. And God can still use us. Amen? All right. Praise God. So I want to get into seven principles, but I'm only going to get into four today. I'm going to fly through these this morning. And touch on them. I'm praying the Holy Spirit really touches your heart as he's touched mine. These are very practical, instructive. You can use this for your own work and your own business. But I'm using it toward the work of the Lord in the ministry as well. Uh, so let's look at them. Number one, if you want to be successful in the work of the Lord. Number one, you have to have a vision for the future. You have to have a vision for the future. Verse five, Paul says, now I will come to you. When I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. He says, I will come to you. Paul was busy in Ephesus. He was planning the church in Ephesus. He was so busy. But he says, I have a vision to get back to you. I have a plan. And sometimes we can get so beat down by the frustrations of our day. So the tragedies that we're going through. The hurts that people have put on us that we can barely look past the day we're having. Just get me through the day. And we keep playing the same day over and over again as Christians. And we're faithful or whatever. We're doing what we can. But, but we, we've memorized that scripture where Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Because today's got plenty of evil in it. But even Jesus had a vision for his life. 
He set his face toward Jerusalem. There was a mark that he was to hit with his life. And so, yes, we're not to worry about tomorrow, but we are to plan for tomorrow. And Paul had a plan for tomorrow. He was always looking uh, for what was... For what needed to be done that wasn't done. He was always looking to fill the need somewhere. Over in uh, Romans chapter 15. He's writing to the Roman church. And he says in verses 24 and 25, uh, 28. He says, I plan to go to Spain after I visit you guys. I don't know if he ever made it to Spain. There are people that said that he did. But why would he want to go to Spain? The reason he wanted to go to Spain is because the gospel hadn't reached Spain yet. And he wanted to go to Spain now. Because he'd already clobbered the rest of the Roman Empire for Christianity. He'd saturated it with churches everywhere. But Paul saw the next mountain to take. Paul saw the next hill to climb. He was always planning and a visionary of how to take ground for the kingdom of God. And we don't come to this church, guys, just to come on Sunday mornings. But this church has a vision. We've started a Bible college. It starts tomorrow night. I'm going to be in one of the classes studying the Gospels. I'd love for y'all to sign up and be a part of that and be with me. If you don't know how, actsbiblecollege.net. Sign up and be there. But we're going to go through the Gospels together tomorrow night in our accredited Bible college that we have so that our kids might have a gap year before we send them off to secular whatever. They can have time with the Lord and know their faith. And this is important, but the, also we've got this private school that's coming on the property. We're going to bring 500 kids on this property that are going to be raised in a Christian environment. How many of you believe in Christian education? You believe now more than ever that people need to raise their kids to fear God. And so we've got K through 12. We've got a Bible college on this property. When you came in today, we had retreats going on this camp. Uh, we're raising up these kids. This this church's name is Generations because we believe in the kids. We're raising up our young people. We have vision. And that's just here. You know, we built that church out in Uganda last year. They had a little shed because they built it their way. And the government came in and said, this is not built to code. It's going to fall over on you. And so we're going to tear it down. And they said, we got to build the code. And I said, how much is that going to cost? And we spent a lot and built that church. And now they have a thousand people meeting there this morning in this church in Uganda that this little congregation helped build. And we've got vision for our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. And we're growing in that vision. And I challenge you today, lift up your eyes and get a vision for your life. In prayer, pray, Lord, put a fire in me. Where would Nehemiah be without vision? He had a vision to restore Jerusalem. It was a burning passion in his heart to go back and build that wall. He took it to prayer. He didn't ask his king, hey, give me a vision. He went to prayer and said, Lord, where is the need? Help me to be a part of the solution. So I want to encourage you guys, be visionary. Start plotting on your future. Start planning. Not only what you're to do, but who you're going to be. Some of you struggle with lust. Some of you struggle with different things in your life. And it, they, it, you're in the struggle. And to you young men, I want to speak to you for a second. The best thing you can do if you struggle real hard with lust is come to church and get accountability in your life until you outgrow it. Get accountability in your life. And then when you get older, you won't be such a crazy person. But you'll have somebody speaking into your life and get, take some steps to getting some victory over those areas in your life that cause you to struggle. I told my two friends that were drug addicts one time, they said, we can't stop doing drugs. I said, well, just come to church, smoke all the weed you can, and then get to church, uh, you know, take the edge off and get to church on Sunday. I said, just do that. And they came for a year and they got free from all the drugs they were doing. And, uh, and they became leaders in, in the church because they just did that. And they let the word of God minister to their heart and they outgrew some things. Amen.
God's called us to be accountable, but, but also to dream. Dream about the day when you won't struggle with the things that you do. Dream about becoming the man of God that he's called you to be. Dream about the family you're to have. Some people that are married, and they have different jobs or they have financial situations that's crunching them and they don't know a way out. I tell them to dream. Get a five-year plan of being somewhere in five years that you're not today and be patient with one another and watch what God will do if you'll just dream. I don't know how you pray and don't dream. How do you pray for your family and don't dream about your family? Most people don't want a prayer life because then they'd have to dream and they don't want to be disappointed. But I'm telling you, in order to be successful, you've got to be a dreamer. You've got to have a plan and you've got to plot on your life like other people plot on sin. You've got to plot on how you're going to become holy. You've got to prepare yourself for it. You've got to pray for it. You've got to shoot for it or you'll never get there. Paul was always looking to the future and letting go of yesterday in order to be successful. That's number one. You've got to have a vision for your life. You've got to have a vision for your family. Not, I hope so. No. You've got to raise up a prophetic voice over your family. Start speaking life into that family and start speaking over those kids. And, start, and you tell them what kind of family we are. And this is how we're going to be. Glory to God. We're not going to let some devil walks in our house and push us around. We're the chosen of God and greater is in us than he that's in this world. Now get out of here. We're here to take ground, not to give it up. I didn't raise a bunch of demon babies. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. They're my kids. Glory to God. They don't belong to the devil. Praise the Lord. Amen. You want your kids to be strong, then you be strong. You want them to be weak, you be weak. But he says here, stand fast in the faith, be brave and be strong. And the word be brave in the Greek is literally quit you like men. Be a man, Paul says. What does be a man mean? It means don't be a boy anymore. Be a grown up. Man up. Paul says, and do everything you do in love. So number one, we got to get a vision of what it is to be men and women of God privately and, and let's get to doing something great for God or let's all pack it up and go home. Amen? I don't want to just be religious and get my head kicked in by the devil. Man, I want to see God do something great. I didn't sign up to be mediocre I, I signed up to see god his great hand upon my life praise god secondly not only do we need to have a vision number two we need to be we need to be flexible with that vision he says in verse six and it may be that i will remain or even spend the winter with you and that you may send me on my journey wherever i go for i do not wish to see you now on the way but i hope to stay a while with you if the lord permits We've got to put if the Lord wills over every plan we have. And we have to be flexible, but we cannot allow our lives to be fickle. There is a difference between being fickle and flexible. You've got to be rooted in the things of God and you've got to learn how to bend like a tree when the storms come. So that you grow well. You've got to be flexible. Stay with me. There was a story in the Old Testament in Genesis where Jacob comes home to Canaan and he runs right into Esau. And they've been, they've been enemies. And Jacob thinks Esau may even kill him. But God reconciles them. And Esau's embracing his brother Jacob. And Esau says, let me be a guard. My men be a guard to your people. To the place that you're going. And Jacob looks back at Esau and says, no. He says, if you lead them, they're going to all die in one day. Because you're going to lead at a fast pace. Let me go at the pace of the little ones. So that we all get there together. And when I first started pastoring. 
I had been an evangelist for five years and I wanted things the way I wanted them. And I had an idea of how the church should be and what kind of church I was going to be a part of and the people I was going to hang around. And I drove a line in the sand and I said, everybody be like me or get out. And I was, I was rigid and I wasn't patient. You cannot build a family. You can't build anything with impatience. You've got to be patient with people. How many of you have ever had a successful marriage out of impatience? When, when Lori and I sometimes need our space, we give it to one another. And we learn, and part, I mean, part of being married is being patient. Don't you know? Learning patience. She said, I snored really loud when I got home. And I said, why didn't you hit me? And she just said, I knew you were tired. And that's a wonderful wife. Isn't that wonderful that she let me snore? Like I had deep dealings with the Lord from the, my gut. I was so tired. And she just let me. I think you're wonderful. You're the most patient person I've ever met in my life. But you've got to learn patience. You've got to be flexible. You can't be rigid. You can't say, I need the finished product right now. And I need everybody on. No, you've got to be flexible. There might be one, more than one way up the mountain. And sometimes God takes you on detours, but you don't lose sight of your dreams. You don't lose sight of what God's put in your heart. You say one way or the other, we're getting there. He says, I may do it this way. I may do it that way, but I'm coming to you. You got to be flexible. But then there are people that are just all over the place. They don't have roots anywhere and they call themselves flexible and they're just fickle. You can't build a marriage without commitment and flexibility. You got to have both. You can't do anything for God without commitment and flexibility. Thirdly. Well, I have other examples in the New Testament about Paul wanting to go to Ephesus and the spirit forbidding him. In. He wanted to go up north. The spirit forbade him. He ends up in Greece. And he came back to Ephesus later on, but you can't steer a stopped car. You've got to be in forward motion and always persisting in what God's called you to and be flexible where he wants to take you. Thirdly, you've got to be thorough. Stay with me just for one more couple of 40 minutes. You've got to be thorough. Look at this very quickly. He says here, uh, verse 6, And it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you. That I may send that you may send me on my journey wherever I go, for I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay with you a while if the Lord permits. He says, if I come to you right now, Cor Corinthian church, I'll just be passing through. But I want a time where I can just stay with you. Stay over the winter. When I was an evangelist, one of the great frustrations of my life was that I would go to a church and I would preach and then I'd leave. And I just put a touch on the church, and I thank God for that. But I went to this one church up in Madison, and it's the church that the Palermos came from, and I didn't even know it when I was preaching it. But I went to this church, and they had the most harmonious, wonderful church, and I was so impressed with this church, and I dreamed. I dared to dream. I said, Lord, would you give me a church like this where people actually love one another, where they really, where there was a family? And I asked the Lord, on the road as a young man, Lord, give me a church like this to pastor. I want to do a thorough work. I want to walk with people through the tragedies and joys and all through their life. And I just want to be there for them. And I, I don't want to just do a superficial work. I want to do a thorough work. And when you come and hear me preach, sometimes I may go a little long, but it's because I have studied all week and I want to do a thorough work. When I preach to you, I don't want to preach a little snippet. I want to preach the full counsel of God. I want to know that you have been warned, that you have been fully counseled by God on Sunday morning before you leave. Because I'm given to thoroughness. You'll never build anything if your commitment is superficial. If you're just putting your toe in the water, you're never going to do anything for God that way. You want to be successful? Learn to grow in thoroughness. Be flexible and be thorough. We have a whole generation of fatherless kids because 
Nobody learned thoroughness. Got a bunch of kids running around. I had a, I had a kid asking me for money on Cash App this week that's living on the streets right now because his parents never studied thoroughness. I'm dealing with all this stuff all the day long because people have just wanting to skate by, get through their day, and then have not studied how to be thorough. God's looking for men and women of God that are parents that are thorough with their kids. That are in it with them, that live with them, that are teaching them, that will never stop. And, a, and pastors that preach the word of God and that are in it with the people. And I don't know success as much as I know how to get in the trench with people. That's the success I know. I know how to get in there when you're not popular and love you and stay with you till you're out of the pit. That's what I'm really good at as a pastor. That's what I've studied and that's where I'm thorough. And I'd ask you guys, don't pass through, but remain and abide and stay because especially in church, if you'll find a church that you love, he says, here, I'm going to stay with you so that you can send me. There's a lot of people that went from church. And then there's some people that get sent. And I'm praying that you get into a church and if God moves you on, you are sent. Instead of just winting everywhere. Do you hear what I'm saying? He says here, I want to stay with you so that you can send me on my journey. Stop winting and start being sent. Be thorough. Is this okay today? Everybody happy still? Be flexible. Get a vision for your life. And do a good work that is start to finish done well. Learn follow through. Instead of getting excited about stuff all the time and never finishing strong. How many of you want to grow in your vision for this year? How many of you want to grow in flexibility with people around you and that you're not so rigid and in pace? How many of you want to grow in being thorough instead of superficial? If you want to be successful, learn how to be thorough. When he went on his missionary journeys, he went to Galatia every time because he was thorough. He kept going back to the places he'd planted. He didn't forget about them. Thoroughness determines effectiveness. And fourthly, and this is the last one. Paul was committed to present service. He says here, I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost for a great and effective door is open to me and there are many adversaries. He says, I'd come to you now, but I've got to stay in Ephesus because I'm so busy in the ministry right where I'm at. God's opened a great door here. And there is a tension that we've got to find between dreaming about tomorrow and being faithful in the now with what God's given us. The Bible says in Proverbs 12, 11, He who tills his land will be satisfied with bread, but he who follows frivolity is devoid of understanding. Proverbs 26, 16 says, The lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. And there are many dreamers who've done nothing for God. They only dream. They're lazy. They're here to tell you everything you're doing wrong. And they ain't never done nothing themselves. There's so many professional critics on social media who knows everything about everything. And they've never played one game on the field. They're all in the stands. But they are the professional observers. And they come in and they'll judge the preacher and they'll judge this and that. And they never preached a sermon in their life. They never stood up here and did it. No. But they sure are good at telling you. You know, it's like Star Search or something. They're in the audience. Telling you one's better than the other. You got to find your lane and you got to find your commitment this year if you want to be successful. You've got to commit to serving. You cannot wait for that door to open and you be completely unproven. You be completely untested. And that great door opens for you and you're not ready. Because you've sat around rigid and dreaming about the ideal and never jumping into the trenches with what is. He says, I'd get to you right now, but I'm so busy with the present, but I'm going to get to you when I can. 
You know, we're going to get to all that stuff when we can. And we are neck deep in ministry right now, right where we are too. And we will grow. And it will happen. By the grace of God, if He wills. In the meantime, let's not give up on our commitment to the present. Our commitment to one another. Our commitment to serving. What are you doing now? Are you a doer? The Bible says, go you therefore. Are you a goer? Are you faithful and little? Don't sit in the best seat if you're a novice. The Lord will raise you up and He will bring that promotion in due time because He glorifies those who honor Him. I'll finish here. He said, a great and effective door is open to me. Fruitful door is open to me right now in Ephesus. Find your door for right now. Find the door that's open to you in ministry and start ministering. We've got a whole group over there saying, please come and help us minister right after church today. Or maybe you're already in, in ministry. Celebrate the door that's open to you. Keep knocking, keep searching until you find your door. Then have the courage to walk through it. Now next week, I'm going to finish with all these wonderful lessons. I'm going to talk about Paul being energized by his enemies and not deflated by them. That's another key to being successful in ministry. I'm going to talk about Paul being a team player with Timothy and Apollos and the rest. You got to be a team player. I'm going to talk about all that next week. And I really like what I have to say about the next time almost as much as I said today. So please come back and we'll finish this. But here's where I end. I'm finishing here. Revelation chapter 3. Jesus said to the church in Philadelphia, He said, you're a little tiny church and you have a little strength left, but you've kept my word. And he said, you're talking to the one who opens a door that no man can close. And I close a door no man can open. And folks, there are doors that God has closed that will never be opened to you again. Stop trying to open that door and leave it alone. But the God of the open door has opened a door for you. You might have a little bit of strength, but there is a door that is greater than your adversaries, than your sin, than your past, and God has opened that door for you. You need to get excited about the great door that is open to you now. And he says, I've opened a door for you, even though you have a little strength. So it's not just Paul who had the open door. It's the church. The little church with a little bit of strength that's held on to his word. He says, I've opened a door for you that no man can shut. And I want to tell you right now, it's time to let go of your past. It's time to let go of who you think you are. Get a hold of the great call of God on your life. And get some courage to walk through the open door and trust that God's going to use your life in a powerful way to imp impact lives for eternity. And if you've been beat up and hurt and you're just looking at your toes this morning, it's time for you to get a vision for your future, for your family, for who you are in God. And begin to walk that thing out and see God move on your behalf in this next year. And let's all be successful in the work of God. And it is God who has called us and He will do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise this morning and honor Him. Amen. For who He is in our midst this morning in Jesus' name. Now let's stand up. We have uh, altar workers that are here to pray with you. Whatever is going on in your life, if you just need prayer, somebody, a friend to pray with you. We're here to pray with you this morning. Maybe you don't know Jesus. You'd like to come and pray and invite him to come live in your life. But before we leave, let me finish here. I'm asking this church, maybe you're new today. I'm asking you, brother, find your commitment in the Lord. And be rooted. And if this is the home that you need to be in, come and be a part of what we're doing here. You're invited to be. If you feel like this is home in your spirit, then come and be a part. We need you. You're incredibly important to us. and We can't do it without you.
But I also want to say this. There's somebody in this place, you've been so defeated because you've had so many things happen in your life personally that you dare not dream. And if you would take a step with me today in faith and say, John, I'm ready to let go of my past and I'm ready to accept that there is an upward call of God on my life. And there's a great door that's opening for my life in 2024, I am trusting God that he is opening a door and he's calling me and it's a great calling and it's bigger than my yesterday. Can I just see your hand today and you say, John, I'm letting go of yesterday. I am letting go of 2023. I'm letting go of the last four years and I'm accepting that there's a call of God on my life. Can I just see you today? Because that's why I came today. I came for that this morning today because today is the day. Lift up your hands right now, all of you that did. In Jesus' name, I declare that the chains of shame and the pain of your life and your vision will not be muddied by the haters who have hated on you. Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And I ordained you to go bear much fruit and that your fruit would remain. He said, but a servant it isn't greater than his master if they hated me they'll hate you and some of you have been so clobbered by this world but you need to hear today there's a call of God on your life and you be, and the door is greater than your adversaries the, Jude the door is greater than the many adversaries of your life by the power of the Holy Spirit in this house today I break the power of the devil off of your life in Jesus name and I, I tell you shake the dust off and you be who God created you to dream to be you say John I'm little I know you're little but he's big and he's your father and he's in you and his DNA is in you and I can't wait to see who you really are and I am dedicated to your becoming in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody, lift up your hands and say, Lord, I let go of my past. I let go of it, Lord. Now give me a future. Give me a future, Lord God. Give me a great open door. Holy Spirit of God, let it be. You who called me by name. You're where the love is, the acceptance is. I find myself in you, Lord God, and you're not done with me. And I give you the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Help me to build well this year. Use it all for your glory. Use every bit of it and use my life. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. One more time, let's praise him today and honor him in the house. Let's praise him. Come on, church. Amen. And amen. God bless you today. We love you. Amen.